My name is Keiko Tanaka. I think most of you know who I am. Um, I'm a rural sociologist in the Department of Community and Leadership Development, but at the same time, I wear two extra hats. One is I have a joint appointment with the College of Arts and Sciences uh, in the Department of Sociology, and I teach over there. And I'm also director of Asia Center. This is, is the first opportunity I can actually wear three hats at the same time to organize this event. And then the, the panel uh, I put together with the three art and science faculty members, what I asked them was to let's debate about this notion of cultural sustainability. Because we hear so much about sustainability in the media, in the newspaper, uh, television, I mean books about food, sustainable uh, food, sustainable agriculture, sustainable community are very popular. And then at the same time, within the College of Agriculture, we haven't quite got a handle on what that means by culture. Because I mean, after all, in the College of Agriculture, we do not have art and humanity uh, uh, disciplines. Um, so I thought that it would be good to bring three uh, faculty members. So objectives of this panel is a two hold. One is to inquire the notion of cultural sustainability. But the second thing, and I think I'd like you to think about this, is to explore opportunities for collaboration between humanity scholars and agricultural scientists, including social scientists. So when I put together the panel, I asked them today, this morning, to answer three questions. One is, does culture matter in sustainable agriculture? Second question is, how should cultural aspects of sustainability, uh, sustainable agriculture be examined or researched? And the third question is, what kind of collaboration between agricultural scientists and humanities scholars do you think would be fruitful to study cultural aspect of sustainability? The panelists we have today, this morning, are first, Dr. Jeff Rice, associate professor. Uh, he's a part of the program of writing, rhetoric, and digital media within the Department of English. And he is also co-director of Art and Science WIRE, that's a residential uh, program. Second is uh, Doug, Dr. Doug Slaymaker, who is associate professor of Japanese. He's in the Department of Modern and Classical Languages, Literature, and Culture. And then finally, uh, uh, we have Dr. Anne Kingsover, Professor of Anthropology. She is the director of UK Appalachian Center. So please, uh, we're going to start with uh, Jeff. You guys get up early. Uh, thank you for having me here. <laughs> um, I'm an associate professor of writing and rhetoric, so uh, my take on sustainability hopefully is still relevant. and I'm uh, interested, I guess, I'll just do a little uh, piece here, on uh, this issue in relationship also um, to one's kids. And this is called menu literacy. So the moment we sit down to eat, our eyes are drawn to the menu. The menu forces interpolation, identification with what I will consume shortly. Short ribs, pho, a sandwich, a beer. When eating in a restaurant, I look away from my dining companions and I examine the list of foods or beverages in front of me. What does this place serve? What is listed? Jack Goody traced early literacy practices to the list. The list organizes experiences in writing. The menu, a type of list, extends what we might call our food or our menu literacy. The menu extends various experiences from the sensory to the salivary, and we in turn work to make sense of the meanings of such experiences. The menu, Goody writes, enables the individuals concerned to deal with variables. With a given menu, anything can change at any moment. There are always variables to negotiate. Some menus are printed on paper, read over meals, then tossed in the trash can at the day's end. The brew pub or the bistro menu is often a chalkboard. It projects the image of the temporary. Items change daily. And with that projection, the sense of being unique or having variety, of being worth visiting multiple times over a short period. Kenny Shopson's menu at Shopson's in New York um, earned fame for its length. At one point, 11 pages long, with over 1,000 items listed, such as taco fried chicken, white chocolate macadamia empanada, and mac and cheese pancakes. Some menus, like in a coffee house, fast food restaurant, Middle Eastern restaurant, or Asian restaurant in a food court, are on the wall. 
We look up to read the list, which may include pictures of what you are supposedly ordering, rather than down, as a traditional paper menu might require. We look up to know. Note a menu from Melenia, Grand Ashet's uh, elegant and upscale restaurant in Chicago. It reads, Matsuka, colon, pine, otoro, mango, trout, colon, monsignor, pheasant, colon, apple, shallot, burning leaves, lamb, colon, pumpkin, eggplant, rosemary, aroma. The easiest analysis of such a sensory menu is simplicity. We find pleasure represented in the minimal. The Alenia menu showcases experiences you cannot order, such as burning leaves or pine. The menu poses food as if one could ask the waiter, can the chef add extra aroma? Roland Barthes writes that, quote, food is never anything but a collection of fragments, none of which appears privileged by an order of ingestion. To eat is not to respect a menu, an itinerary of dishes, but to select. Senses are one such fragment or variable. This fragment contributes to an overall literacy of the menu. To have a menu literacy is to have the ability to navigate and make sense of such fragments. Menu literacy is a specific type of ordering and of sustainability. On the old Japanese iron chefs prior to cooking, Mishiba would often write out his menus in stunning calligraphy. He took the time to write before he cooked in his timed uh, competition. Mishiba wrote in a minimalist yet maximum form of writing, calligraphy. During the Battle Net NATO uh, episode, for instance, Mishiba begins with a large sheet of paper and writes, as the show's hosts translate for us, meaningful course, natto dinner. Again, the presentation is simplicity, a minimal arrangement of words that are meant to describe ingestion as well as experience. Bartz recognized the Japanese dinner as a moment of ordering uh, or structuring meaning as an experience. He writes, the dinner tray seems a background of the most delicate order. It is a frame containing, against a dark background, various objects. A dinner's order, Bartz notes, is visually organized, like a painting, or we might add, like calligraphy. By composing your choices, you yourself make what it is you eat, he tells us. This practice of writing before eating, we are told by the Iron Chef announcer, is, quote, customary for Japanese chefs. We might also read Bart's notion of the Japanese chef as the one who writes, who practices a type of literacy, the cook who cooks nothing at all, he stresses. Mishiba, in that sense, is not doing something odd by preparing a menu prior to prepping for the one-hour battle, nor by prepping a course whose menu is listed only as meaningful. He cooks nothing at all. He is practicing a literate act. Thus, he never cooks, and indeed, iron chefs do poorly on the Japanese version when they actually cook the food rather than leave it raw. He writes, he orders, when he forgets to write his menu, he neglects to demonstrate his menu literacy, and he loses the battle. And the customary practice the Iron Chef announcer pledges is unnerved. In the American version of Iron Chef, the menus have been composed off camera. When the secret ingredient is revealed to the contestants in a very non-secretive and non-meaningful way, when does the writer take the time to compose the fragmented items on a given menu, we might ask while watching the show? Writing a menu quickly, as we might imagine the Iron Chef contestants doing, can easily become an uncritical literacy. We may live in the culture of new media, but we also live in a culture whose critics ask that everything be slowed down. When the writing of a menu is slowed down, we might believe meaning can be better and more critically ordered, and such as the New Yorker's Calvin Trillin's dilemma when ordering Chinese food. He fears that the quickly written Chinese characters on the wall hide a gastronomical secret, and writes, the walls are covered signs in Chinese writing, signs whose Chinatown equivalents drive me mad since they feed my suspicion that Chinese customers are getting succulent dishes that I don't even know about. <laughs> Trillin fears that calligraphy hides from him a sense of literacy. And thus, through all these patterns and ideas, I'm wondering about the menu as a reading uh, or literate experience that can sustain us or that we can sustain. I tend to eat quickly, and our daughter tends to eat very slowly. A fast food menu is predictably read quickly. Customers don't read. They rely on already known commonplaces of meaning, um, cheeseburger, fries, Cokes. One can easily order from the famous Billy Goat Tavern in Chicago without reading the menu. Cheeseburger, Pepsi, chips is the commonplace form by the Saturday Night Live skit of the restaurant. A fine dining menu is read slowly. Each dish needs to be understood before ordering. Foie gras, braised, sweetbreads, confit. What do such terms mean, we might ask each other, or the waiter or waitress. Yet we can learn to read by reading food collections. Menus are collections, fragmented selections of experiences we arrange as a composition or a meal. We learn to be literate by choosing from courses, from slowly or quickly scanning the lists in front of us. 
from ordinary experience into meaningful ways. We learn via simplicity, like at Alinea, an exaggeration, as most other menus that depend on adjectives to persuade ordering demonstrate. In our particular family's travels, we've covered many distances from our previous home in Missouri to here to Kentucky, to each coast and places in between. And as we stop to eat or drink, I delight in taking pictures of my daughter ordering from menus. And I was going to show you some pictures, uh, but we couldn't get to work. Uh, I quickly and uncritically photograph her as she holds up the menu. In her own literacy acquisition, there is simplicity, uh, one or two or three or four-year-old girl reading, an exaggeration, of course, because I take this picture as a hyperbolic moment in our lives, as, as if to say, she reads, she orders, she eats. We want our children to become literate, and I want my children as well to acquire a menu literacy. Our daughter loves to hold out the list of choices in front of her as if choosing among the options. Her first contact with print is choice to order, to organize, to select. As parents, do we not do the same? Do we not organize our children's lives as such? Here we read this menu from the Avery Brew Pub in Colorado as opposed to another. Here a Vietnamese menu. Here, now you have culture. I'm selecting for her. I am searching for her in my version of the meaningful course. I am fashioning a sense of menu literacy for her the ways print was fashioned for me in my early schooling and the way the digital has been fashioned for me over my uh, 20 years, uh, by graduate education, daily consumption habits, my own reading, teaching, and scholarship. And as a parent, I delight in every moment our daughter organizes some part of her own day, dress or food or toys that she puts together. And these things extend to her as well a form of food sustainability. But the menu, the menu, it adds something entirely to the process of order and organization. It adds my particular ordering. Bartz reordered Japan according to his own sense of literacy and how he had been interpolated into being an admirer of what he called a fictive nation. And menu literacy extends my own interpolation to the category of experience we call family, where interpolation occurs on other levels as well. I like food. I want our daughter to like food. I want her to like what I like, as my parents once tried to order me according to their own desires. I want her to not like what most of the country likes when it turns to fast food for nourishment or pleasure. And just as William Burroughs begins his novel, The Nova Express, with the famous line, for God's sakes, don't let that Coca-Cola thing out, I transform my ordering to keep all fast food, candy, junk food, and similar items out of our daughter's sense of identity. The menus I put in her hand before snapping a picture are my efforts at encouraging interpolation. Identify with food, I say. Ident have a sense of sustainability. Hear it call you, hail you, and develop a food or a menu literacy. Thanks. Um, Doug Slaymaker, can you hear me? Is it, is it sounds going through okay? Okay. Um, I'll do this a little differently, I think. When Keiko first talked to me about this idea of a panel on culture and sustainability, I said, great, I'm in, right? What a great idea. Um, because I care about culture, it's in large part what I do, and in my case, with special attention to Japan and Japanese culture. And I care about sustainability, right? Who doesn't? Why wouldn't everyone? And further, I care about this group, agriculture, uh, the way it revolves around food, great food, thanks again to Bob, right, and, and all the sorts of things we do here. Until I sat down and tried to decide what I'm going to talk about. I have no credentials, right? I do literature and film. Don't louder? Speak up a lot. Yeah. Okay. When the mic is in the That's not it? Okay. All right. Louder it is. Um, where am I? Because I don't really know what I'm talking about, except I like food and sustainability. Uh, literature, that sort of thing. And I've thought about these things in the past. Uh, we've had Japanese novelists to do sustainability issues here on campus, for example, and in that uh, realm I've been involved with all these sorts of things. And Oh well, here we go. If the question is, does culture matter in sustainable agriculture, I think the answer is obvious. Of course, it's a good question. But more to the point is how, right? How does culture matter? in all of these things. And all of this entire conversation presumes some sort of interaction with or figuring out what is meant by terms such as culture and sustainable, right? Well, sustainability for its own sake is not necessarily good, right? There's no need to sustain lousy practices, cultural or otherwise. And many of you know a lot more about sustainability than I do. I will leave that to you. I want to talk a little bit about culture. Um, and for my purposes, for uh, reference, I often borrow from an Australian scholar of political identity, and I'm going to whittle down a, a full page I, uh, a definition of culture into three points, uh, just to help give us some 
um, landmarks, I guess. One, culture as a public realm, right, with images that form a gallery of objects that make sense within a culture. Shared imagery, things we shared, shared ideas, uh, objects, things that make sense to those of us who live in particular cultures. Two, uh, those images and ideas change across time, right? None of these things are stable, they move, and part of being a culture is being participant in that transformation of how Coca-Cola changes in, from the 1920s and 1950s and 1970s to the present, for example, right? Uh, participant in that change defines members of a culture. And then the cultural knowledge and the experience of belonging resulting from figuring out what those images mean, how we interpret them, what they mean for us in ways that they mean different things for other people, for example, how it defines us as a group. In other words, practices, images, ideas, clothes, language, of course, food, food practices, relationships to land, uh, assumptions about where those practices come from, right? our sense of history and shared stories, all that stuff and where we are going. And if that group is engaged in sustainable practices, to what degree does the culture matter, right, is one of the questions I'm thinking about. And I, I assume here that it matters. I'm taking that as a given, right? It matters. But how much and to what degree and what does that mattering look like? Well, that's a much stickier wicket. Um, for me, Japan forms a nice test case for me since it's a place I care about very much. I spent a lot of time thinking about. It's not my, false cu my first culture, right? I'm an outsider, so there's a lot of an analysis going on. Um, and in some ways, the longer I've been in Kentucky, I'm intrigued by the Japan part of this equation because of important overlaps uh, in speaking g very generally in broad brush applications, important overlaps um, to issues that we get between rural Japan and rural Appalachia in this area, right? Long histories of people with tight families, and these are region specific, of course, right? But long histories of people with tight families, uh, people with strong ties to land, uh, long traditions of how they use their land, uh, traditions of orality and oral um, storytelling, perhaps, music, local arts, which can also be accurately cast, of course, as insular and close-minded and not interested in outsiders and new practices, tinged with violence, simmering long memories, sometimes mystical relationships to the land. All these things are shared, right? Overstated, of course, but all this stuff is shared. Uh, and in, and also, of course, many of you know this, Japan has been a source of inspiration at numerous levels in all sorts of sustainable agricultural communities. Uh, for example, in but one example of the book, The, the One Straw Generation, that's now, what, 100 years old, I think, uh, came out in its earliest English translation, had a preface by Wendell Berry in the 1970s, right? So these, these uh, overlaps between rural, rural parts of Japan and rural parts of the U.S. go way back. Um, and likewise, in some ways, Japanese agriculture, to the degree that I know it, is built on myriad small farming plots, right, which has encouraged over centuries great care and long-term commitment and concern by the farmers and the people responsible for that land. Also practices, of course, which have taken a, a, the brunt of U.S. criticisms for inefficiency and all sorts of issues that we hear all the time, right, in these conversations. Um, and of course, rural Japan is not the only place that has had a system of small family farms that were sustained in large part by convoluted and propped up artificial economic schemes, right? Rice in one place, tobacco in another. Um, and, but one upside perhaps, and it's a conversation that we're having here, it's one that's being had in Japan, that these small plots uh, may in fact, the, the network of farming, the network of communities may in fact be a boon for reorganizing how agriculture will look in a new age. Namely, this small scale, albeit labor intensive, but therefore responsive to demands for local, fresh, responsible, trustworthy, local people I know, et cetera, et cetera. Right? These are also parallels. Nonetheless, Japan is also, of course, one of the most profligate of consumer and commodity-based cultures on the planet, based on cons consumption, immediate gratification, uh, throwaway uh, uh, ethos, the very pr practices that, in the end, will gut sustainable agriculture. And further, I think this is well known, right, there's a, in Japan there's sort of a cultural, again, overstating the case, but a cultural predilection for, for perfection in, in food which is probably, in point of fact, a commodity capitalist-driven desire for niche markets, a relatively recent uh, 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 part of Japanese consumer culture. But it's also meant for Japanese culture in the main, in response or uh, driving the whole thing, right? It's all, uh, Japanese agriculture has been one of the most chemical-rich and supplement-driven in the world as well, right? 
And this, this, this interest in perfection is a cultural, perhaps, cultural variant that Japanese farmers have had a hard time overcoming, right? We have our own issues here, and some of them are acute, more acute, acute in different ways in Japan. But one example here is the amount of waste of perfectly good food, right? It's not sufficiently perfect, it's not sufficiently uniform, it's not sufficiently marketable. And how does, uh, the, the, do farmers deal with this? There are cultural specificities for this, it seems to me. Culture matters. And practices. Another way this shows up, uh, 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 something of an overlap, right? Cult Japanese agriculture has another issue that's cultural in a way and more acute than that facing us here, right? The aging population of farmers. This is no small issue. And in response to this, some of the Japanese responses have been uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries began, for example, a few years ago, a program to subsidize urbanites to go to farms for a week. It's heavily subsidized with train tickets and hotels and all sorts of stuff. I mean, it's a version of ecotourism, but it's got a very Japanese-specific, cultural-specific um, valence to it. Less uh, organized scale, many areas around Japanese urban areas, there are numerous ways in which factory workers or office workers can take off and work on a Saturday or Sunday uh, on farms near to their offices, right? another version of ecotourism. Or third, there's a real movement in Japan, it seems to be more robust than here, of trying to entice retirees back to farms, right? And some of this seems to be people who have been disengaged from farming for two or three generations at this point, but going back and trying, uh, what, I mean, one thing it seems to be is trying to keep people on increasingly abandoned uh, farming regions. Okay. Another place that looks different in Japan is the way that agriculture is urbanized in much of Japan. And I mentioned small plots above, right? One of the things that we think about here uh, in Japan, much of these plots are within city limits, and indeed one-third of Japanese agricultural products are generated in urban agriculture, uh, and has been for some time. And there are cultural valences here, and culture in this case may be nothing more than tax laws and zoning issues of, of why it remains that way. Nonetheless, they are cultural practices in ways that people have dealt with the land that they live on. Um, and so the way, it, and so it means that you find, you know, small rice paddies and chestnut tree plots, etc., uh, uh, pear trees scattered around uh, Tokyo and Kyoto and places like that. This is not sustainable by any means, as it exists now, but at the same time it points to interesting things. And there are cultural valences in the way people live with agriculture uh, in their backyard, in, in, a, in a manner of speaking. And it also might allow for more integrative patterns of agriculture sustainability, to allude back to my suggestion about small plots above. Um, the growth of intentionally small-scale, low-input agriculture is a sizable growth area in Japan as well, right? And in response to a demand for locally produced food, there's access, proximity matter, and other cultural valence, of course, is the fallout, literally, uh, from the Fukushima plant, uh, the recent tsunami, and the way that that whole disaster has uh, uh, shown a spotlight on real stress uh, points and weaknesses in Japanese systems of all sorts, but transportation and food distribution among them. Um, but it's another uh, moment in this issue of thinking locally, produce, where's my food coming from, and the, and the safety of it. Culture would also seem to point, and this is the last of the things I want to mention here, culture would also seem to point to local food ways, right? How does culture matter in what we do with our food? And I'm inclined to think that the impetus is the same in a variety of places, right? You, and especially if you dig back to rural ways of using food. You take what's in season, you always got too much of it, what are you going to do with it, how are you going to preserve it? Uh, culture matters in a sense that soy sauce and miso and sake leaves and rice vinegar provoted, provide a different flavor profile for the preservation, but the fact of and the motivation for, for preservation is in fact shared, right? And so the way that this goes back and forth, there are cultural differences and they're important ones, but they're the things that are shared as well. This is the same. As is at the same time an increasing awareness that we need to go back and listen to our grandmothers and figure out how the forgotten ways to sustain the food, which is then less about cultural valences in sustainable agricultural pro uh, processes, but about cultural sustainability, right? Sustaining our cultural practices, which is another issue entirely, perhaps, but not unrelated. So that's a list of all the things I don't know much about. Um, <laughs> and many of you know a whole lot more. So I think that was the point of this. Let's have a conversation at the end, because you've all written about this and teach classes much more than I do. But I know that here at the end, I'm left where I started, that catch culture matters in all sorts of ways and all sorts of things. But the how of it is far less clear to me and much muddier and much more interesting. But the impetus for practices and problem solving many of these things may be shared, but there's the, the way we go about it, the solutions uh, are quite different. Thanks. <laughs>
Good morning. If I start mumbling, would you raise your hands in the back and flap them around? Thank you. Um, I thank Keiko for inviting me in the group and um, for inviting all of us, and I look forward to working with many of you in the future. I'm delighted to be back at a land-grant university where we can have a conversation between the College of Arts and Sciences, the College of Agriculture, and the community. This is fantastic. As you know now, Keiko asked us three questions. So the first one was, does culture matter in sustainable agriculture? And I would say, yes, culture matters. And you all know a whole lot about this already. So I was really surprised that Keiko was asking us to, um, to even bring up <laughs> culture, because you're all doing this. In the Trobrian Islands, a man named Jerome was studying to be an agronomist. And he was also in line to be the chief of his community, which had a religious role as a practitioner of magic. An interviewer asked him, don't you find a conflict between magic and science? And Jerome replied that he didn't have a problem with it at all. Magic was magic and science was science. The problem tended to be for the interviewer. Jerome said they were two different ways of knowing, and he drew on them both. When he planted yams, he used both fertilizer and magic. Closer to home, I'm sure you can all think of examples of this, planting by the moon and by the textbook and um, both. Those ways we have of making sense of the world and deciding how to act in it have to do with our culture. And I'll try to give you some examples as an anthropologist of how I think culture does matter as we talk about, study, and practice sustainable agriculture. There are, as we've heard, and I really appreciate the comments of the other panelists, hundreds of definitions of culture. Anthropologists have been making them up, sitting around making them up for a century and a half. And I won't bore you with a century and a half of long definitions that look like everything in the kitchen sink anyway. But basically, as you've heard from Doug, culture is shared. You can't really have one by yourself. It's learned. We pass it down through institutions, families, mentors, and change it gradually over time. It's like a framework that we build and alter together over generations for understanding and acting in the world. You hear people talk about things like national culture, religious culture, business culture, ethnic culture, class culture, and punk culture. But those aren't fixed systems that you can just learn or take into account as a variable. They're sets of beliefs and practices and assertions about where we are, who we are, and especially what those rock bottom truths are for each of us that people argue and even go to war about. And they're changing all the time, even within a single person as we participate in multiple cultural frameworks from the workplace to the family reunion. Culture can be completely intertwined with sustainable agricultural approaches and practices, as you know, and they've been supporting them for thousands of years in some cases. Stephen Lansing has written about this in relation to cultural regulation of access to water in Balinese agriculture, and some of you may know this story, some of you may give this example in classes. For a thousand years, residents of Bali in Indonesia have been intensively working terraced rice paddies with irrigation cooperatives providing access to water through irrigation channels from the river. The gates were opened into the channels leading to the rice paddies on a schedule that was controlled by the timing of Hindu temple festivals. The modernization of agriculture in the 1970s, introduced according to another cultural way of organizing knowledge and activities, Western scientific traditions, brought fertilizer, pesticides, and a shift away from having the irrigation co coordinated through religious culture. A team of engineers from Clemson University, in fact, built a computer program to control the irrigation, and to sum up Lansing's findings, the temple festivals turned out to be much more sophisticated and successful a way to organize the irrigation system than the computer program was. The traditional regulation of water also kept pests down because all the fields were flooded in um, close together and kept people upstream from hogging water that needed to go to the downstream folks. So everyone's agricultural practices were sustainable when irrigation was coordinated by the temple festivals, a system to which many communities returned in time. There are other examples of traditional cultural practices fostering sustainable resource use. The Tucano, an indigenous community of around 10,000 people in the Northwest Amazon, have maintained sustainable manioc cultivation and fishing in a fragile blackwater environment on the upper Rio Negro by culturally prohibiting cultivation or logging along the river's edge, thus leaving enough resources to keep the fish population going in nutrient-deprived river water. So in blackwater, the resources have to drop off the trees for 
for the fish. Culturally, the Tucano have traditionally believed that the riparian forest belongs to the fish, not to humans. And there are very strong rules, cultural rules, against taking fish from the spawning grounds. The belief is that fish families are equivalent to human families in those places. And for every fish taken by a Tucano, there'll be a Tucano child taken by the fish families in the river. This ideology of reciprocity enabled people to inhabit an area that with another culture's practices of deforestation along the water's edge, which would make sense by another logic that you would log near the water to transport the lumber, um, that would leave the area uninhabitable over the long term. I don't bring up these cultural beliefs to somehow idealize the traditional in relation to the modern, but to say that culture has had a tremendous role in organizing what we know have been sustainable agricultural systems over many centuries. And there's much to be learned from that. As we know, high-tech, high-investment agriculture, once thought to be the answer to sustainable food production during the Green Revolution, led to our realizing that cultural practices of seed saving, water distribution, and mixed land use had a lot to teach us about sustainable agriculture. Rather than superior and inferior cultures, we can now better see globally that they're just different ways of knowing and that they each bring something to the table, as Jerome indicated. Closer to home, there's a lot of interest now in sustainable agriculture and food preservation practices that were not so long ago ridiculed as backward because they didn't demonstrate what was culturally valued, participation in a cash economy. In these times when cash is scarce, the places where there wasn't a tech or housing bubble to burst have a lot of cultural knowledge to share about getting through these times. But sometimes cultural divisions keep us from learning across generations, class, ethnic, or regional identities. Here's a cultural question, and many of you may have thought about this and been talking about it for a long time. Why is the sustainable agricultural movement gaining so much popularity now, when those of us who participated in, this, in it in the 70s and 80s in the US, often in intentional communities or places like the Land Institute and the New Alchemy Institute, were considered counterculture? Jim Hightower's work, the American Indian movement, seeing the earth from space, and the energy crisis all figured into that, as did liberation theology and church-based community gardens and farmers markets in the 70s to increase food security in urban contexts in which resource inequities were very visible, so people were acting on that. In the current resurgence, because of a culture, is the current resurgence because of a cultural turn away from the economic logic that has led to the greatest divides ever between the rich and poor, as well as an awareness of stewarding finite resources? I think there are a whole lot of cultural reasons to talk about and lots of cultural resources to be drawn on in the current attention to sustainable agriculture. A cultural dimension of sustainable agriculture that I've been puzzling over is why the people interested in local food and sustainable agriculture, sometimes called foodies, are not always talking with those who have the greatest knowledge funds already, like agricultural extension agents. There may be some class differences between those who are newly attracted to branding local foods and those who've long produced and consumed them as a matter of course, but that's not always the case, and I don't think, it's, it's, um, I don't think we can give some simplistic analyses here. I see the construction of local food and sustainable ag programs in high schools on the one hand, and simultaneously defunding of vocational ag and FFA programs on the other, and this just doesn't make sense to me. As a society, we need to recognize expertise across cultural barriers and learn from many different traditions in approaching agriculture in an inclusive and truly sustainable way. What difference does the use of words make in those divisions of sustainable agriculture? I think um, my co-panelists have already brought this up. Why are some terms considered hot and some not when they may refer to exactly the same thing? What cultural baggage do they carry? There's a real role for linguists here in thinking about the cultural aspects of sustainable agriculture. There's some very practical reasons for paying attention to words and the way people classify the world. Someone trying to sell an agricultural product needs to know how people think about it culturally. In Kentucky, if we run into an avocado in a dish, it's usually associated with chili and considered a savory food. When I lived in Sri Lanka, I was interested to see that avocados are considered a sweet and would never be served as a savory food. People said, yuck, if I, show, if I uh, served it with chili. Instead, there's avocado ice cream. Pineapple, on the other hand, would never be served as a dessert, but instead with chili. 
Food classification has to do in that case with Ayurvedic medical beliefs about what foods are heating and cooling for the body. And that has nothing to do with their physically being hot or cold. Gail Wagner, an anthropologist, has been interviewing people with picture cards for years now, asking them what is a fruit and what is a vegetable, and thinking about those areas of confusion and what that means for the way people eat, plant, and organize produce. This brings me to Keiko's second question. How should the cultural aspect of sustainable agriculture be examined or researched? In cultural anthropology, I think our most powerful tool is listening, and most of you have that in your toolbox as well. I've learned a lot by talking with farmers in Nicholas County for the last 25 years and listening closely to what they have to say about the long-term future of farming there. It seemed impossible 25 years ago for a tobacco town to become a tomato town when the marketing infrastructure had not been worked out for large-scale vegetable production, but it doesn't seem so outlandish now. Interviewing then is an important research method in thinking about the cultural aspects of sustainable agriculture, whether that's unstructured life history interviews or more structured interviews that enable comparison across conversations guided by similar questions. Putting culture at the center of an analysis of agricultural practice can help us see certain things, just as focusing on class relations or soil pH help us see other things. In my research, for example, by focusing on tobacco culture, I was able to see how a cultural emphasis on tobacco's role in livelihoods and the community economy masked the larger economic role of cattle production, for example, and how a cultural <coughs> emphasis on Jeffersonian independence of the family farmer masked the role of hired labor for centuries, or paid or unpaid labor, on small farms in Kentucky, from enslaved African immigrants to Irish immigrants to recent Latino immigrant workers in tobacco. Historical research can contribute a lot to our analyses, too, especially in understanding what cultural beliefs and practices have fostered sustainable agriculture over the long term around the world and right here in Kentucky. Long-term historical research helps us see patterns and similarities across cultural contexts. A century ago, for example, tobacco farmers were striking in Kentucky about the prices monopoly buyers were paying at the same time that Mexican farmers were revolting against international owners replacing their small-scale sustainable farms with large-scale monocropping plantations that paid them so little they were worse off than before they entered the cash economy. We can learn from those long-term cycles in the organization of agriculture cultural production through archival research methods. Attention to culture and language in our research can help us ask questions like, what gender is a farmer? What do who do children think about when they see the word farmer? Who do they picture when they hear the word sustainable agricultural producer? We can ask them. That's one of the things that we can do as a methodology. So Keiko's last question was, what kind of collaboration between agricultural scientists and humanities scholars will be fruitful to study cultural aspects of sustainability, as you've heard? I think interdisciplinary collaborative research is always stronger because we see things through a variety of lenses that we couldn't see with just one. We all get a little territorial about our lenses, especially in these times, but we really need them all. Here are some practical ways to study the cultural aspects of sustainability. Culture affects decision making. If we understand more about the cultural basis of motivation and how people make sense of things, it helps with planning processes. Let's say there's a plan to start a farmer's market. There'd be interdisciplinary attention to what's being produced or could be produced within a certain radius of the market, to the feasibility of the site itself, to the relationship with other businesses in the area, and to potential consumers. An inclusion of cultural analysis would help us understand the need for halal foods or kosher foods. Um, it'd help us understand how food might be organized within the space of the market and the role of language. With increasing cultural diversity, it's important to understand the cultural expectations that people bring as producers and consumers, as all of you know. So for some people, human waste is a desirable soil amendment. For some, it's not. For some, a horse is a desirable food item, and for some, it's not. One person may be committed to sustainable local food production for social justice reasons, another for energetic or environmental reasons, and another because of a fear of terrorists poisoning the food supply. As an interviewer, I've heard all of these reasons. Social scientists and humanities scholars can help sort out the logics that people are using, and in interdisciplinary research teams, 
focused on sustainable agriculture, we can learn more together, I think. Understanding cultural differences and the strengths that each cultural framework brings to sustainable agriculture is important not only internationally, but nearby as well. Since 1990, 48% of the population growth in Appalachia, for example, has been comprised of Latino, African American, and Asian residents. It's a culturally diverse region, even though it's often not represented that way. The most prevalent languages spoken in Appalachia right now in order are English, Spanish, Vietnamese, Arabic, Korean, Urdu, and Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian. I bring this up because it matters substantively what sustainability and farming practices mean in each of these languages and across individual and cultural histories. County agent Mike Phillips told me once that long-term resident farmers and Amish newcomers found respect for each other's agricultural practices and that there were some interesting discussions going on in the classes in his Ag Extension office between members of different groups. I think common ground can easily be found between other groups, like the Slow Food Club and the FFA, or the College of Arts and Sciences and the College of Agriculture, but it requires those same listening skills and respect for each other that Mike Phillips saw happening in his Master Cattlemen's class between the long-termers and the newcomers. <laughs>